Vitanirvidyamananam Ichatama Kuto Bayam Yoginam Nripa Nunitam Hori Nama Nu Kirtam. This is a very important verse. It describes three kinds of persons who attain success on the path of constant chanting of the holy name of Krishna. This Hari Nama Anu Kirtanam means chanting Hari Nam uh, constantly. Anu. Anu means concentrated. Like the word Anu in Sanskrit also means atomic. So uh, atomic, that also means something that is very specific, very concentrated. So in this in this case, Hari Namanu Kirtana means concentrated, dedicated chanting of the holy name. So, those who are, the three classes here are those who are nirvidyamana, those who are yogis, and those who are ichatam. Ichatam means full of material desires. The nirvidyamana, or those who are completely free from all material desires, means the devotees of the Lord. So they have certainly already attained complete success on the path of chanting the holy name of Krishna. Because one who is nirvidyamana is one who chants the holy name of the Lord completely free of the ten offenses, which were explained by Srila Prabhupada in this purport. So, their chanting is called Shuddha. It is pure chanting. Uh, by pure chanting, uh, three wonderful effects are experienced. Tushti, Pushti, Kshutta, Bhaya. So, Tushti means taste. A pure devotee of the Lord, uh, he relishes the holy name of Krishna. Therefore, he chants it constantly because chanting is so sweet, it is so full of nectar. And pushti means nourishment, just like when we eat the body. Oh, actually, these three points also pertain to eating, too, as well as to chanting. When we eat, there is taste. And when we eat, the body is nourished, the body is made strong. Mm -hmm. 
Kurs. So uh, pushti means nourishment. <clears throat> so when we eat, our material body is nourished. Of course, when we take prasad, then we are spiritually nourished too. But generally, it is understood when one eats food, the material body is nourished. Uh, when a pure devotee chants the holy name of Krishna, his spiritual body is nourished. This means, although he's already established perfectly in Krishna consciousness, in pure devotional service, in his transcendental position in the spiritual world, as he continues to chant the holy name of Krishna, his transcendental position becomes even more established, more and more perfect, endlessly. His uh, activities, transcendental activities in pure devotional service are incre ever increasingly enhanced, ever increasingly nourished as he chants the holy name. And then finally, Kshut Apaya. Uh, Kshut Apaya means the satisfaction of desire. Kshut uh, actually refers to hunger. So again, just like when we eat, it tastes nice, it nourishes the body, and it satisfies hunger. So, when a pure devotee chants the holy name of Krishna, all his desires are immediately satisfied. Thus, the pure devotee, uh, his quality, one quality of the pure devotee is Satya Sankalpa. Satya Sankalpa. Sankalpa means desires, the desires of the mind. They're always satisfied in Sat. Sat means eternity, in the absolute truth. So Satya Sankalpa. His desires are satisfied not in this world, uh, but in the spiritual world. So, therefore, although a pure devotee <coughs> may come to the material world to preach, to rescue conditioned souls, he has actually nothing to do with this world. Just as a lotus, Sri, uh, Sri Krishna in Bhagavad Gita gives this example, as a lotus, although it is situated on the water, it is not actually touched by the water. The lotus uh, cannot become moist by contact with water. It always remains dry. So, Srila Prabhupada once said, the great art of preaching is to go fishing without getting wet. <laughs> His, uh, 
state of wetness means to become influenced, to become affected by material association. But a lotus, therefore a pure devotee, is compared to a lotus. We speak of the lotus feet of the pure devotee, or the Lord's lotus-like devotee. Yes, he's just like a lotus, for many reasons, because lotus is such a wonderful thing. It is full of so many good qualities, so you can compare it... Uh, uh, lotus to appear to devotee in different ways, but this is one important way, that uh, the lotus never becomes moistened, never becomes wet, like even when it is directly contacting water. So then, <clears throat> those who are near Vidyamana are those who chant the holy name of the Lord free from the ten offenses. <laughs> those who are yogi, uh, who are, as described here, self-satisfied by dint of transcendental knowledge, uh, they are, as we've been saying in previous classes, atmarama, uh, self-satisfied. So they become attracted to the chanting of the holy name. Uh, they are crossing the threshold uh, between, you know this word, threshold? <laughs> they are crossing the threshold between material existence and the spiritual existence. Mm -hmm. So their stage of chanting, if they chant the holy name of the Lord, they begin, their chanting begins on what is known as the clearing stage. The technical term is Nam Abhas. A pure devotee, his chanting is uh, Shuddhana. He chants the pure name of Krishna. He uh, knows fully well that the holy name and the Supreme Lord himself, personality of Godhead, are the same, identical. Whereas the second class, the yogi, he is just entering uh, transcendence by his chanting. Although uh, he does, he does not uh, have direct perception of the personality of Godhead as being non-different from the holy name. Therefore, the Nam Abbas stage is compared to the dawn, when the sun is just uh, behind the horizon, the, the sun light, the early morning light, is illuminating the eastern sky. So this illumination from the holy name of the Lord, whose full identity, uh, the, the Nama Prabhu's full identity is not yet completely understood, but there is illumination. That is this transcendental knowledge. 
that is mentioned in this verse? When, uh, following this example, when the sun actually rises into the sky and can be seen, that is compared to the state of Shudana, chanting the pure name. So, for a yogi, an Atmarama, to become uh, perfect in chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, he needs to receive the mercy of the Supreme Lord and his devotees. Mm. <coughs> Although the yogi is very advanced. Still, uh, his tendency, it's even there in the name Atmarama, his tendency is to rely on his own uh, achievements in austerity, in renunciation, in transcendental knowledge. Mm -hmm. So, this sense of, of being advanced, that I am advanced, I have attained much in my spiritual efforts, is also ultimately a hindrance uh, in attaining the state of pure chanting. Mm -hmm. So, just like there is the story of one brahmachari who was very curious, because that is a quality of yogis. This brahmachari, brahmachari means he was a lifelong celibate uh, who was practicing great austerities. He was only taking milk. That was the only food he accepted. So such, uh, such persons are jigyashu. They're curious. They're very interested in spiritual advancement. So he was very curious to attend the Nama Sankirtan performance of Lord Chaitanya and his confidential associates at the house of Srivas Thakur. He begged Srivast Thakur, please, because uh, in the beginning of the Lord's Sankirtan pastimes, uh, his chanting with his devotees was confidential. It was only performed in the house of Srivas or in the house, also in Lord Chaitanya's own house, as well as the house of other great Vaishnavas. But it was not <coughs> performed in public where everyone could see, because everyone, as I said, they, those persons have taken birth in this neighborhood. <laughs> they were the same persons. They were very envious. Mm -hmm. 
So, the brahmachari, he begged Srivas Thakur, please let me into your house for, uh, so that I may directly see and hear the kirtan of Lord Chaitanya. And Srivas Thakur said, that is not possible. Lord Chaitanya is very particular. He insists that only pure devotees may uh, be present during his kirtan. But the yogi, this brahmachari, he begged and he pleaded. Finally, Srivas Thakur relented. All right. Yes, I, ca I cannot say that you are an impure person. So you may hide. He, he gave him some place to hide in his house so that he might, might see uh, through a crack in a door or something. He might see and hear the kirtan. So when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu <coughs> came with his associates and the kirtan began, the Lord complained after some time that I am not feeling the ecstasy tonight of uh, Krishna Prema, of pure love of Godhead. There is some influence here which checks the flowing of love of God. What can that be? So we question Srivas Thakur. Is there someone in your house who is not a pure devotee? Srivas Thakur had to admit, well, I, there is one yogi here. <laughs> Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, What? A yogi? <laughs> And Srivas Thakur said, but he's very pure. He lives only on milk. <laughs> Lord Chaitanya said, who said anyone can attain love of Krishna just by drinking milk? <laughs> so the yogi had to come before Lord Chaitanya. And Lord Chaitanya, he rebuked him. He said, you have smuggled yourself in here in this association, uh, but you are not a pure devotee because you are proud of your accomplishment in your renunciation, your austerity. You are proud that you only drink milk. And thus you are disqualified from tasting the nectar of love of Godhead. So get out! So, this was actually Lord Chaitanya's mercy. He, Lord Chaitanya, in this way, cut down that last trace of pride in the yogi's heart. So the yogi submitted, yes, uh, I'll not argue. Uh, what you have said about me is true. So I will leave.
But as he was leaving, the yogi was thinking to himself in his own heart that although I am not a pure devotee, tonight I have been really blessed, I have been truly blessed because I was able to see the kirtan performance of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and his pure devotee associates. Now tonight my life has really become perfect. So Lord Chaitanya is omniscient, he is all knowing. So he knew immediately uh, the yogi's thoughts. And so, just when the yogi thought like that, Lord Chaitanya told someone, bring him back. <laughs> so this, at this point, the yogi was then accepted into the assembly of pure devotees because he had given up his pride. So this <coughs> narration from the Chaitanya Bhagavat is a very nice illustration. It's a very nice story that illustrates the position of a yogi as compared to the pure devotee and also illustrates how a yogi might become a pure devotee by the mercy of the Lord and his devotee. He received the mercy of Srivas Thakur, first of all, that he could enter the house, and then he received the mercy of Lord Chaitanya in the form of this chastisement which cut down his pride. So, by this mercy, then even subtle traces of offense, because one on this platform, uh, as I said, this is Nama Bas. He is uh, able to perceive the reflection of the holy name of the Lord. So, there are no gross offenses. <coughs> But there is still some subtle offense. Mm. And then, thirdly, there are those who are ichata, means those who are full of material desires. This verse says, they may also attain success on the path of chanting the Hare Krishna Mahamantra. Now their chanting is actually offensive, aparat. So how, how is it possible? that they can attain success. That is by shraddha, by faith, and by constant practice. Mm -hmm. Then gradually their offenses diminish. They come to the clearing <coughs> stage, and then by the mercy of the Lord and his devotees, they may come to the pure stage of chanting. It is not to be misunderstood as offensive persons do. Those who are, who are actually faithless offenders, you see, who have no shraddha, 
I have no actual faith in the holy name, even though they chant the holy name. Uh, they think that, yes, I have material desires, and if I chant, my material desires will be satisfied. This is offensive. Many of the ten offenses uh, pertain to this particular attitude. For instance, to think that the holy name of the Lord, chanting the holy name of the Lord, is an auspicious ritualistic ceremony. Or to think that the holy name of the Lord is the same as the name of demigods like Durga and Shiva. People worship Durga and Shiva. Or people engage in Karmakanda ritualism. Why? To satisfy their material desires. So, one may begin to chant the holy name of the Lord with material desires, but if he has shraddha, then his aim is actually to become free of material desires. He has faith that if I chant, although my heart is full of so much lust, I have faith that if I chant, and if I have the favor of the Lord's devotees while I chant, that this raging fire of lust will be extinguished. See, this cannot be understood as mercy by a gross materialist. Uh, the pretenders who chant the holy name uh, with only the intention of satisfying material desires, they certainly are not uh, prepared to see the their sense gratification broken. But one who is actually faithful, one who is actually sincere, he's waiting for this. <laughs> he's praying for this. The material senses are compared to serpents, cobras. Uh -huh. <coughs> so they're always biting us. <laughs> and when they bite they, with their fangs, when, when they bite us with their sharp fangs, we become injected with the poison of material sense gratification. Which pollutes our whole consciousness. So, Srila Prabhupada Nanda Saraswati has said that one of the effects of receiving the mercy of Lord Chaitanya, Lord Chaitanya Sankirtan movement, is that the fangs, the teeth of these cobra senses are broken. So the senses are still there, 
And they may even try to bite, but there's no effect. So those who are sincere, even though they are still in the offensive stage, they're praying, they're desiring very much, they're chanting constantly, uh, awaiting the day when the fangs of the material senses will be broken completely. When it happens, they praise Krishna, they thank Krishna, they they welcome him. And they take shelter of the Lord, the Lord's service, the Lord's devotees, with greater and greater enthusiasm. Just like I heard a funny story last night. <laughs> I, I call up Anamanta Prabhu in, in Athens just to see how they're doing. And then he told me how, uh, because the Padiatra has come from Italy to Greece, so the Athens Sankirtan devotees are also uh, joining the Padiatra. And so they were staying this past week uh, for one night at the house of a friend of Krishna in the city of Corinth. So uh, this friend, his name is Kostas. In Greece, every second man is named Kostas. <laughs> yeah, it's Costa. Yeah. In Greece, it is so common. Whenever Anumanta starts to speak about our friend Costas, I have to say, which one? Because <laughs> there's at least five of them. <laughs> This is Costas of Corinth. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, this Costas, he had, he was engaged to be married. Uh, and he's been a friend of Krishna for a long time. So, he was thinking, let us say he was in the illusion, that this lady that he was about to marry was a very nice girl and he would be able to to bring her along on the path of Krishna consciousness. Mm -hmm. But <coughs> as we've been saying, there are persons who seem favorable, who may seem favorable, who may seem inclined to Krishna consciousness, but actually they have no real faith. Their attraction is simply for sense gratification. So this lady was such a person. Hmm. So, uh, when such pretenders uh, enter into the association of real devotees of the Lord, then their actual nature is exposed. They suddenly...
So this lady, she became very alarmed when she saw the house suddenly occupied by, <laughs> by a dozen or more devotees. And uh, she was alarmed seeing how much Costas was serving and respecting the devotees. And she was thinking, he's showing them more service and respect than me. So, uh, therefore, all of her hidden material motives, they all manifest at once in a big explosion. <laughs> so, the devotees had just prepared a feast, and they were, as you, as you know, the devotees were sitting down in a line, and the feast was just being served. And Costas, he invited his fiance. So let us sit down and take prasadam. And she said, No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the most amazing thing. <laughs> that she had a handbag or something with her. And she opened it up. And she pulled out. I don't know how, where she got this from. And how it got in her handbag. But she pulled out a raw piece of meat. That was wrapped in a, in a paper. And she said, I'm going to cook this. And you and I are going to eat this. <laughs> <laughs> so then there was a a typical scene, typical Greek scene. <laughs> Costas and his fiance they were shouting at each other, and all the devotees were Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. <laughs> And this woman was waving the meat around. <laughs> and so the whole marriage broke up <laughs> that night. It ended up with her packing her bags and storming out, slamming the door. So then Costas, of course, he was very shocked, but the devotees preached to him, actually, this is Krishna's mercy. He, Krishna has saved you. Just imagine if you had married this woman. <laughs> so then he was pacified and he took prasad. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Any questions? Hmm?
Yes? Certainly. Because <coughs> uh, it is auspicious because they are being encouraged to chant by the devotee of the Lord. So they're receiving the holy name from the right source. And if they chant the holy name uh, due to some some kind of affection for that devotee, even if it is this family type of affection, but even because of that, if they chant the holy name of the Lord, then they will uh, attain positive benefit. Yes, because they are they are most humble. <coughs> Lord Chaitanya, who is Krishna himself, assuming the role of a devotee of Krishna, he used to, although he was <laughs> displaying the ecstasies of Mahabhava, of, of Srimati Radharani's own ecstasy of love of Godhead. If someone would praise him, say that, oh, you have so much love for Krishna, he would, he would deny it. He would say, I don't have a drop of love for Krishna. Because if I did, how could I be in the material world? <laughs> This is the one wonderful uh, mystery about those who are situated in a very intimate relationship with Krishna that they think of themselves as being so far away from Krishna. Because they can see directly how great Krishna is. And then this makes them think of how unworthy they are. Uh -huh. So, just like Lord Chaitanya also, when he wanted to see Lord Jagannath, the gatekeeper, the one in Jagannath Puri, <coughs> they have these persons who stand by the gate just to, to see that only approved person can persons can enter the temple. <coughs> so Lord Chaitanya came to Jagannath Temple one day in mad ecstasy. And he said, I want to see Krishna, the son of Nanda Maharaj. Please, can someone show me Krishna, the son of Nanda Maharaj? And this is a very special request because Lord Jagannath is actually Krishna, who is the Lord of Dwarka. He's not showing his Vrindavan Leela as son of Nanda Maharaj. So, <coughs> the doorkeeper, he was a simple person, so he was thinking Krishna is Krishna. <laughs> Uh, 
No? So he was just thinking, Lord Jagannath is Krishna, and Krishna is the son of Nanda Maharaj. Is Nanda Lord Jagannath and Krishna, Krishna is Nanda Maharaj? So he said to Lord Chaitanya, come with me, I can show you the Lord of your heart, Lord Krishna, Nanda Sutta, the son of Nanda. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he became so happy to hear this. He took the doorkeeper's hand and he said, you are my special friend. If you can show me the son of Nanda Maharaj, I will be most grateful to you. So Lord Chaitanya accepted the doorkeeper as a, con as a more confidential associate of Krishna than he. So when the doorkeeper, therefore, because Lord Chaitanya is God, and if he, <laughs> if he presumes that someone is such a confidential associate of Krishna, so when the doorkeeper brought Lord Chaitanya into the presence of Lord Jagannath, Lord Chaitanya actually saw the son of Nanda Maharaj, Vrindavan Krishna, and he, his heart melted in ecstasy. And so he was considered, uh, Lord Chaitanya was thinking, today I have been especially favored by this very wonderful devotee <laughs> who has shown me uh, the, most, uh, uh, the Supreme Lord in his most confidential form. So, from this story, you can see that this attitude of the Mahabhagavata, that everyone is a better servant of Krishna than I, is actually his mercy upon all the all living entities. Because he's so eager, you see, this is his he has such love for Krishna. So he's so eager. Seeing them this way, others are more advanced than he. He wants them to help him uh, advance in Krishna consciousness. And so in this way he engages them in devotional service they actually end up serving a pure devotee. You see, he's, and he's accepting their service as if they're helping him. This is his wonderful mercy. Srila Prabhupada used to tell his disciples, his disciples would praise him, Srila Prabhupada, you're so advanced. Prabhupada would say, he would many times reply, you're more than I am. <laughs> <coughs> Because this vision of the Mahabhagavata uh, causes him uh, to be the best servant of Krishna because he thinks everyone else is a better servant so he wants to serve them all. And then they can see from his example, what it means to serve Krishna. <laughs> yes. This vision of the pure devotee, the, uh, that all of the living entities are better servants of Krishna than he, Mm. 
this is the cause of his excellent example in service to Krishna because he, wa he is therefore desiring to serve all of these more advanced devotees. And they, in turn, by seeing his example, then they learn what it means to be a devotee of Krishna. The spiritual master, just like Srila Prabhupada, uh, he felt himself to be the servant of his disciples. He was serving them, but in the role of spiritual master, but nonetheless, he was serving them. And so by seeing his servant, uh, service, then all of us, his disciples, could understand what it means to be a devotee, what it means to serve Krishna. Uh, It is a possible by uh, committing offenses. For instance, by the mercy of a pure devotee, by the mercy of service to a pure devotee, one can be very quickly raised up to this platform we're speaking of, when this, the senses are actually broken. But if by this, by let us say, close proximity with the pure devotee, he's rendering service to the pure devotee, he's received his benediction, his senses are controlled by his relationship of service with the pure devotee. But if by the close proximity he becomes too familiar with the pure devotee, taking his uh, great fortune for granted, he starts to think of the pure devotee as an ordinary person, as he's my friend, <laughs> like that, <laughs> then that's an offense. And by the offense, then the mercy, which is keeping that devotee in such high position, the mercy diminishes and thus he falls and his senses become agitated again. Mm -hmm. 
means Krishna in the form of the holy name. So we pray for the mercy of the Lord by praying to the, uh, his pure devotee to bestow that mercy upon us. And uh, we pray also for the same mercy to Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So therefore, before chanting the Hare Krishna mantra, we should chant the Pranam mantra of the spiritual master and the Panchatattva Maha mantra. In this way, we shall receive the mercy of the holy name to bestow that mercy upon us. And uh, we pray also for the same mercy to Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So therefore, before chanting the Hare Krishna mantra, we should chant the Pranam mantra of the spiritual master and the Panchatattva Maha mantra. In this way, we shall receive the mercy of the holy name. So yes, the chanting of the Hare Krishna, of the holy name of Krishna, is uh, effective in at all times, all places, all circumstances. But in other yugas besides the Kali Yuga, there are other devotional processes which are also effective in and of themselves. So in other yugas, devotees also chant the holy name of the Lord. But some devotees, especially those in exalted positions, those who are leaders, they practice the Yuga Dharma. To establish the proper way of Dharma in that particular age. Which, as you know, in the Satya Yuga is meditation, Treta Yuga, sacrifice, Dwarpa Yuga, temple worship. So, because in those yugas these other processes are, are prominent, therefore, uh, it's well, what I want to say is it's not that the holy name, the chanting of the holy name of the Lord is less potent, but it is less, perhaps, prominent because these other processes are there. Hmm? 
But in the Kali Yuga, all the other processes are ineffective. Only the holy name, the chanting of the holy name of Krishna is effective, as effective as in any other age. So it's in the Kali Yuga that the uh, topmost, actually the chanting of Hare Krishna mantra, the holy name of Krishna, is the most effective process. In Kali Yuga that becomes obvious. Because it's the only process that's left. And your second question is answered by the fact that there are different forms of Krishna or uh, different transcendental functions. And therefore, these different forms of Krishna display certain potencies. Lord's, uh, Lord Vishnu's potency is displayed uh, as the maintainer of the material world. So therefore, it is said that uh, chanting the holy name of Lord Ram three times is the same as chanting the holy name of Vishnu one thousand times. Because Lord Ram Chandra is displaying internal lila, uh, a lila of the relationship of the Lord and his devotees. Whereas Lord Vishnu is not, not so much doing that. His, his main activity is in the creation, maintenance, destruction repeatedly of this material existence. And chanting Krishna's name just once is the same as chanting Rama's name three times because Krishna is his pastimes display the most intimate relationship with the Lord. So this, if you will, this measurement of the potency of different names of God is in terms of rasa. All the holy names of Krishna are absolute. That means if one chants them, uh, one is raised to the liberated platform. So in that sense, they're all, all the holy names of Krishna are one and the same. But within spiritual life, there's also variety, and that's seen in rasa. So there is definitely a difference between the pastimes shown by Lord Mahavishnu, Lord Ramchandra, Lord Nishringadev, and Lord Krishna. It is not, otherwise, if we said they should all be the same, 
uh, in all respects, and that we would be mayavadis, we would be impersonal. Do you understand? Do you Yeah, so it is stated, Aradhanam Sarvesham, Vishnu Aradhanam Param, that uh, of all different forms of worship, the highest form, the supreme form, is worship of the Supreme Lord Himself. But yet, there is something even higher. <laughs> and that is the worship of Tadia. Tadia means uh, the paraphernalia or the property of Vishnu. And this specifically refers to the Lord's devotees, they are his property. So if one worships, just like Prabhupada used to say, like, like a man keeps a dog, dog is his property. So, but if someone visiting the house shows affection to the dog, then the man likes that person even more than if he just shows affection to himself. So yes, if we chant the name of the pure devotee, Krishna is satisfied. He's, he's satisfied even more than if we chant his name. Just as he is satisfied, just as Lord Krishna is more satisfied if we chant Lord Chaitanya's name than his own name. Because Lord Chaitanya is the best devotee of Lord Krishna. Then someone may say, well, why don't we only chant the name of Lord Chaitanya and the name of the pure devotee? And that's because Lord Chaitanya says, and the pure devotee says, chant the name of Krishna. <laughs> So we have to follow their order. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to stop here. Shiva Prabhupada Ki Jai.